Thanks so much for having me today. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. And uh, I'm really pleased to be able to talk to you this morning. So I'm going to talk to you today about white matter development in um, childhood and youth work that we've been doing lately in my lab. So I'm going to start by talking about work we've been doing in late childhood and adolescence. And specifically, I'm going to talk about some of the work we've done using advanced white matter measures to provide increased specificity over uh, the traditional DTI metrics. And then I'm going to talk about atypical structural brain networks in children and youth with prenatal alcohol exposure, or PAE. Then we're going to shift gears into the younger children and talk about brain development in early childhood. So just a brief intro to how we actually do the imaging in young children. And then I'm going to talk about typical white matter development in those young kids, how that brain development relates to early language abilities, and then finish up by connecting it again to prenatal alcohol exposure and talking about altered white matter development in young kids with PAE. So over the last 25 years or so, diffusion tensor imaging has really provided a wealth of information about white matter development. Using metrics like FA, DTI has shown massive development in the first couple of years of life, really dramatic increases in FA there. But we also know from a plethora of other studies in older children and adolescents that FA continues to increase into young adulthood in some of the brain regions. So DTI has shown this continued development into young adulthood. It's told us a lot about how those trajectories look, specifically that they're nonlinear. And it's also revealed a lot about regional variation, where we have these frontal temporal connections, and you can see some of the areas in red in this brain image here showing much later, more protracted development than some of the other brain regions that tend to reach their plateau earlier. So DTI has been really valuable in this regard, but we know that DTI parameters are not very specific. They're highly sensitive to white matter microstructure features like myelin, axon packing, axon coherence, but we don't know which of those processes is changing specifically. More recently, there are a number of other techniques that can provide us some additional specificity to the changes that we see in brain development. And NAUTI is one of those techniques. So neurite orientation, dispersion, and density imaging, NAUTI, provides us with a couple of metrics that get a little bit more specifically at what processes might be changing here. So the neurite density index is a measure that's sensitive to myelin and axon packing. And a few recent studies have looked at how this measure changes with age in late childhood and adolescence, showing that it's actually a more sensitive measure of age-related changes than FA. So on the top here, this is a study from Silligench where they showed that the NDI measure was much more strongly correlated with age than any of the diffusion metrics were. So indicating that it's highly sensitive. ODI, which is a measure of axon coherence, did not show significant changes with age. So we're getting a little bit more specific and also more sensitive with this NDI measure over the diffusion metrics. In our own data, we showed something very similar where we had nice, robust, widespread increases of NDI that were actually a little bit um, bigger than the increases we saw with FA and no changes of ODI across the same age range. So NDI is more sensitive to age-related changes. It's also a little bit more specific than the DTI. And it's telling us that probably what we're seeing is related to changes, increases of axon packing and or myelin rather than changes in axon coherence. There are other measures, non-diffusion measures of white matter that can tell us again about processes that are occurring. So magnetization transfer is one of these techniques and it's sensitive to myelin. There haven't been a lot of MT studies in development, but there have been a couple. And they tend to show either no significant change or a slight decrease in magnetization transfer ratio across adolescents. So this is a study from 2009, Perrin et al, where they showed no significant changes in females across adolescents, but a very slight decrease in MTR across adolescents in the males. 
So this suggests that we're not seeing massive changes in myelin in this age period, but maybe it's more related to axon packing. And then of course we have myelin imaging techniques like myelin water imaging, which gives us myelin water fraction or sometimes called myelin volume fraction. Sean Dione's group has done a lot of work using this technique in infancy to show massive changes in myelin water fraction in the first year or so of life and then a relative stability across the next few years. Of course, we also have some of those post-mortem studies like Yakovlev and Lacour's where they showed a lot of myelination happening in the first year of life, that's this period here, and then ongoing myelination, particularly in association areas into the second and even third decade of life. But keep in mind that these are post-mortem samples, so we're not looking at changes within individuals, and of course this type of study is limited by the availability of previously healthy subjects. So I think it's a little bit of an ongoing question still what the processes during adolescence are that are happening during maturation, and particularly whether there are changes to myelin during this time period. And so this is one of the things that we've been interested in doing in my lab. So there are a lot of these me metrics I've covered. Um, we talked a little bit about MT. There's a newer technique in homogeneous magnetization transfer, which offers additional specificity to myelin within the brain. And so we've been using that and the, the parameter that we've been using from there is quantitative IHMT or QIHMT. And then also, if you combine the metrics from myelin water imaging and from NAUTI, you can calculate an estimate of G ratio, which is the ratio of the inner to the outer diameter of the axon here, and also provide some indication of white matter development. So all of these different metrics provide differential sensitivity and specificity to white matter to aspects of white matter. You can see that they're all sensitive to white matter. They provide slightly different contrast, a lot of shared variants, but also slightly different profiles when we look along tracts here. This is the cortical spinal tract, just as an example. So we were interested in looking at these metrics, and this is work done by my former PhD student, Bryce Gearhart, where we looked at 50 healthy children and youth from 6 to 15 years old and about half of them returned again two years later. So we had longitudinal data in a subset of them and the whole age range was 6 to 17 years. We calculated all of the metrics that I showed you previously. We looked at whole brain tractography and then isolated the major white matter tracts of interest and looked at each of these parameters within each of those major white matter tracts and looked at how those change with age. So we saw widespread increases of FA and decreases of MD and I'm not going to focus on those because we knew that that's what we would see and that's what every other study has shown. We also saw widespread increases of neurite density index across the age range. Basically all of the tracts showed increases of NDI. And we saw some changes in myelin volume fraction and then a couple of areas where G ratio was changing. So what we have here on the top are the three different patterns that we observed. These are tracts that show changes of neurite density index but not myelin volume fraction or G ratio. And this is really, interestingly, predominantly right hemisphere tracts. Then in the corpus callosum and a group of left hemisphere tracts, we saw increases of NDI and myelin water, myelin volume fraction. And then in the unsenate fasciculus bilaterally, we saw increases of NDI and myelin water, as well as decreases of G ratio. So these plots down below show some examples of one tract from each of those groups. So the left unsinate here has the increasing NDI, the increasing myelin volume fraction, and the decreasing G ratio, while the body of the corpus callosum has the increasing NDI and myelin volume fraction, but no changes in G ratio. And then the right cingulum here has increases of NDI, but no changes in the other two parameters. Interestingly, we saw no significant changes in QIHMT across the brain. 
So given the widespread increases of NDI, but the relatively limited changes in the myelin metrics, I think it's clear that the maturation across adolescence is really dominated by increases in axon packing. But we also did show these changes in the myelin water fraction for the first time in adolescence, suggesting that there really are some changes in myelin. Given that we saw no changes in QIHMT, it may be that this is really a change within the water in the myelin, not specifically what the myelin water imaging is measuring. So we have these increases in axon packing with some limited changes to myelin water across this age range. Now, I kind of pointed out earlier when we had those measure maps that there's a lot of shared variance across these parameters. And you can see that again here, I've just highlighted it in the corpus callosum. So they really do have a lot of shared contrast, but they do provide some unique measures too, and they're not uniform across the tracts. This shared variance becomes even more apparent when you look at a correlation map of the metrics. And you can see, for example, that the diffusivity metrics are very highly correlated with each other, or that FA and NDI have a pretty strong correlation. So really there's shared variance here, and I think it can be useful to capture that in different ways. Now there was a nice paper that came out last year by Max Chamberlain looking at principal component analysis to reduce the dimensionality of different diffusion metrics. And they had a number of tensor metrics as well as some pixel based metrics and when they put it into a PCA they came out with two principal components that they attributed primarily to restriction and complexity. So the restriction component ended up being dominated by really anisotropic factors. So measures of anisotropy, radial diffusivity for example are loading heavily into this restriction component. Whereas the complexity component was dominated more by things like fiber orientation and meat diffusivity. So getting at tissue complexity, but less anisotropy in this component. So we used this technique in our data as well. So we had all of these different diffusion metrics plus our non-diffusion measures of white matter. And when we used PCA to look at this, we ended up with three different components. Our first two components were very similar to those in the previous paper. So principal component number one in our data was analogous to this tissue complexity principal component in the previous study, where it's really dominated by things like orientation, dispersion, and mean diffusivity, getting at the, the complexity of the tissue. Principal component two was more related to that restriction and anisotropy, and we see, whoops, excuse me, big, com big uh, kind of contributions from FA, radial diffusivity, NDI, for example. Then we also ended up with a third component that we think is likely mostly reflecting, reflecting axon diameter. So this had myelin water fraction and G ratio in it. And uh, we think that a lot of the anisotropy is captured here. So this is really axon diameter. I just see a question popped up. Yes, um, uh, Pedro, um, if you want to mute yourself, you can ask your question. Or you can read. Thank you. I can ask now or I can ask at the end. A couple of the slides ago before you showed increasing some metric overall, but on quite a few individuals, there was a decrease. Are you and talking about this slide here? Like so you're talking about this slide here? Uh, oh, you're talking about within some of the individuals well, having the decrease like, here. This is what you mean, right? These yeah. individual drops? Yeah, yeah it's, it's a really good question and it's something that we have spent a lot of time in the lab figuring out more generally, not necessarily within this data set. Um, really what is driving individual changes when we maybe that go perhaps against the curve. And I don't have a great answer for you in this data specifically, um, other than to say we see some going up and some going down. And we know some of that is probably measurement error, but not all of that. Um, we're currently digging deeper into this data set to look at some other measures of cognition and behavior and environment to see whether that can help us explain some of that 
uh, that variation, both in trajectory and in the actual values of it. Okay, thank you. So yeah. those values are um, the average of all the values in, in a track or are the mean from the mean track or? Uh, like the individual points here, you mean? Yes, each individual point, what? Yes, so each of these dots is one scan from one subject and it's the average NDI across the tract here. So this is the left uncinant. So this dot, for example, is the average NDI across the left uncinant in this one particular subject. So uh, all the tracks inside the uncinant, it won't, it won't be like the mean, the, the media, the mean, yes, the mean track of the uncinant. It will be every, yeah, I guess it's every track. Like, for example, there you have the corpus callosum, mm -hmm. and it's like a, a, a big, uh, like it's all along the corpus callosum. Right. So your, your, your dot will be the average along all the corpus callosum. That's right, yes. Um, we did divide the corpus callosum into genu body splenium, but yes, the body of the corpus callosum is a, a huge segment, and this is the average across the whole body. Yeah, we've done some a long tract analysis that generally tends to show the same type of pattern that we're seeing here. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks for those questions. So um, I was just talking about this PCA analysis. So we've ended up with our three principal components, the tissue complexity, the restriction or myelin and axon packing, and then our axon diameters. So we looked at how each of these components changed with age in our group. And so what we saw was that component one, that's the complexity component, was related to age in the left arcuate, and that's uh, shown here, principal component one versus age, we see these increases, but that was the only place where it was correlated with age. Whereas component two, which is that restriction or axon packing myelin component, was very strongly related to age in most of the tracts we looked at, and that's shown in the scatter plot here. And then component three, which we think is mostly reflecting axon changes, had no significant relationships with age. So this is really in good agreement with the data I showed for the individual metrics themselves, where it's really supporting the idea that adolescent, late childhood and adolescent development is really dominated by axon packing rather than other changes to fiber coherence or the axons themselves. Now I wanna give you an example of an atypical condition or a neuro neurodevelopmental disorder that we do a lot of work in. So I'm gonna talk about prenatal alcohol exposure and PAE is associated with cognitive, behavioral and neurological problems. And these are lifelong problems that are present in childhood and they persist. PAE in some cases is also associated with facial dysmorphology. Fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, or FASD, is the neurodevelopmental disorder associated with prenatal alcohol exposure, and it's quite prevalent, actually, with estimates of about 2 to 5% in the U.S. and about 4% in Canada. So just to put that in perspective, that's two and a half times more common than autism. And in individuals with PAE, we tend to see very widespread brain alterations. We see smaller brain volumes, and then we see widespread alterations to white matter as well. So this is an old study. It's actually from my PhD. But when we looked at major white matter tracts in the brain, everything here that's shown in red or blue or yellow had abnormalities in the PAE group compared to controls. So again, tracts in every part of the brain really are showing these abnormalities. And this made us think about looking at um, atypical connectivity at a more network level. And so we looked at structural network connectivity in a big group of participants with PAE. So this is 121 participants with prenatal alcohol exposure and then matched controls a relatively wide age span from five to 18 years. And we collected data across Canada at four different sites. So they all collected DTI data that was as well matched as it could be across the scanners. And um, my postdoc here, Zhang Yu Long, looked at using the uh, automated anatomical labeling template, subdivided the brain and created this connection matrix. 
So in PAE and controls, and then we used graph theory to compare metrics of this network. And what we saw is um, lower efficiency in the PAE group, longer, shortest path length, and just these general network changes indicating that the network was not as strongly connected or functioning as efficiently in the PAE group as it was in the controls. So probably not surprising given the widespread white matter abnormalities, but really showing that this is a, a problem at the network level as well. And then we looked at structural connectivity, not just in the entire brain network, but in these individual networks as well, and how they were connected to each other and how they were connected within themselves. So these blue lines show reduced structural connectivity either between networks or within a network here. The thicker, darker lines are tests that survived multiple comparison correction. But what you really see is, again, widespread disruptions to structural connectivity that are affecting many, many of the brain networks and seem to be primarily or predominantly affecting the sensory motor network, actually. And then um, just to bring in a little bit of functional data, because I think this is a really interesting comparison, we also looked at functional connectivity from the sensory motor network, and we see decreased connectivity, functional connectivity between the sensory motor network and areas of the default mode network. So some nice agreement between the structure and the functional connectivity here. Now to summarize this sort of first section of the talk, we see ongoing white matter maturation in late childhood and adolescence that appears to be really dominated by changes to axon packing. We also see some changes to myelin that are probably driven by changes to the myelin water itself. And then in children and youth with prenatal alcohol exposure, we see these disruptions to the structural network and connectivity among networks. So now I want to shift to a younger age range now. <clears throat> and you've seen some of these plots before, but we know that there's a rapid brain development that takes place in the first couple of years of life. So really massive increases in FA, um, sometimes of more than 100% actually over that first year of life. And if you look even at structural images, you can see quite substantial changes to the white matter in those first years of life that really reflect ongoing myelination and other maturation processes. And we know from um, a wealth of DTI studies that changes in FA, again, continue into young adulthood, and I showed these plots before. But one of the things that's really been missing for a long time is this sort of in-between age range. So there aren't very many studies that include participants between about two and six years. There are some, and you can see some of them here, but they don't tend to have a lot of participants and we haven't been able to really detail development during that time. And this is a really critical time for a lot of cognitive and behavioral maturation. And I think it's very important to understand in more detail what development is looking like here. So this is one of the things we've been working at in my lab for a while now. Um, but part of the reason why there are no or are very few studies in this early childhood range is that these young kids move a lot. And these are my kiddos. It's hard enough to get a, a photograph of them without them moving. They don't even realize they're moving sometimes. Um, so it can be very challenging to get an MRI scan from them. And on top of just the fact that they like to move and they don't always know they're doing it, MRI is noisy, it's claustrophobic, and for most of them, it's unfamiliar. So we've been working really hard to make it, make it friendly and happy and enable some data collection in these young kids. Our scanner at the Children's Hospital looks like a rocket ship. We've put this facade over top to make it a little bit more child friendly. We have a mock scanner that we can use to let the kids prepare for their scans so they can practice here, put in a parent or a stuffed animal and just get used to the system. And we try to put them through our astronaut training program. So they first they go in the mock scanner and then they graduate from that to the real MRI scanner and then they are officially an MRI astronaut at the end of the process. 
my um, former research assistant also wrote a book about the process and it's actually freely available online. That's a long link. So feel free to email me after if you're interested. Um, but we send this book to kids ahead of time and we read it to them when they come in to really talk about the process and the noises and that sort of thing. Just get them comfortable with it. And we've certainly had a lot of fun with it and some of the kids have too. We got this really sweet note um, last year from one of the girls that's participated in our study over the last few years. So we've been acquiring data in these young kids for a while now. Um, we're over well over 500 scans on about 200 typically developing children. And these kids were recruited between about two and five years. And then we've been following them ever, ever since. So the older kids are around eight. They're actually a bit older now. Of course, we haven't been able to scan for a few months, but we'll look forward to continuing to follow them after. So these kids um, are in the scanner, if they can, for about 45 minutes. We get some diffusion data. We get it um, at a lower B value and then later at a high B value if they're still tolerant of the scan. We get structural imaging, so that's T1-weighted anatomical, and then we also do a passive viewing fMRI scan. And now it's passive viewing because the kids are watching a movie. And in fact, we let them pick their own movie, which we find dramatically increases their compliance and their excitement to go in. It's maybe not ideal from an fMRI standpoint, but it does enable us to get awake MRI data even on these two and three year olds. When the kids come in for their scans, we also do some quick pre-reading language measures to look at their language development. And then we're really fortunate that most of these kids were recruited from a different ongoing study that recruited women during pregnancy. So these kids have really comprehensive prenatal and postnatal histories about their exposures, their experiences, um, maternal mental health, for example. So we have a, a really rich data set. And so this is work done by my um, former postdoc, Jess Reynolds, looking at structural brain development in these kids. We were really interested in detailing the white matter development given that we have such a nice longitudinal data set. So you can see from these anatomical images that although there's not as much change as there is in infancy, there is substantial white matter change that's apparent even to the naked eye. You can see that the white matter volume is increasing between these two scans, two years apart, this is the same individual. And then when we look quantitatively, we also see substantial increases in white matter volume. So in this plot, each of those gray dots is an individual scan from an individual subject. The lines themselves are the best fit lines for each individual subject with the girls in red and the boys in blue. And then the black, the thicker black line is the overall fit across all of the participants. So substantial increases in white matter volume across this age range. But then of course we're really interested in looking at white matter microstructure. So we looked as well at diffusion parameters and first I'm showing here just the whole brain, FA and MD. So unsurprisingly we're seeing increases in FA, decreases in MD. We're seeing a little bit of non-linearity toward the end of the age range there. And this, you know, this is, is something we could have figured out by connecting the dots of the infant studies and the studies in older childhood. But we were really interested in looking at regional variation as well and just getting better detail for what's actually changing during this time period. And when we looked at the individual white matter tracts, we saw that they sort of fall into three different groups. <clears throat> and the first group showed relatively slow development across the age range, but started with relatively higher FA. So this is multiple areas of the corpus callosum there in red, as well as pyramidal tracts in green here. So as an example, this is a plot from the splenium. So it starts with relatively high FA, changes by about 0.04 across the age range. And you can see most individuals are going up there and uh, the best fit line as well. <clears throat> 
Then we had another group of tracts, and this was the uncinate and arcuate fasciculus, where we see again relatively slow development, again about 0.04 across the age range, but certainly steady development. The difference between these two groups is that this group started with relatively high values of FA, and this group started with relatively low values of FA. And then finally, we see this group that had much more substantial, faster development across the age range. So this is the, the inferior longitudinal, the frontal occipital fasciculus there. And we're seeing changes about double what these other tract groups were seeing. And in fact, changes that are so substantial that we can see the nonlinearity in these tracts. So what we really think is happening is we've got this one group that has undergone a lot of development prior to this age range in infancy. And we're seeing sort of the later stages of its maturation once it's starting to slow down. And then we have this group here with slow development but low initial FA that basically has a long way to go. This is like the slow and steady approach here. And we know that the incident and the arcuate continue to develop into young adulthood. So we're really seeing the slightly earlier phases of development in these tracts. And then in these association tracts here, the ILF, the IFO, we're seeing this massive development indicating that early childhood is really an important period of development for these tracts. We were also able to look at uh, naughty measures in some of the kids. And so we see increasing NDI, again, widespread throughout the brain, really following a very similar pattern to the changes that we see in FA. So increases of NDI in the splenium that are relatively smaller than some of the other brain areas with higher initial values of NDI, lower initial values of NDI in areas like the uncinate with still development ongoing, and then a little bit more substantial change in areas like the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus. <clears throat> when we looked at orientation dispersion index, we saw increases of ODI, again, pretty widespread across the brain. They were relatively small increases, but they were uh, consistent across the brain. So this is suggesting that really axon coherence is actually decreasing across this age range. So this is in contrast to the data I showed in later childhood and adolescence where we saw no significant changes in ODI. We are seeing some changes in these younger kids. And it's interesting because increasing ODI would actually be associated with decreasing FA. So this may be um, even causing us to underestimate some of the changes to axon packing that might be happening during this time. We also saw increases in QIHMT. So again, this is in contrast to the lack of changes we see in later childhood and adolescence. So QIHMT is increasing, again, pretty much throughout the brain in all of the tracts, indicating that there's ongoing myelination during this early childhood age range. <clears throat> Now, this is a study by my colleague, Cindy, Sydney Bray, and uh, one of her PhD students, Dennis Diamond, where they looked at 122 scans on 73 kids, all girls, in a, a somewhat overlapping age range. And I highlight it because it was done on the same scanner with relatively similar data. And what they found agrees very nicely with what we're seeing in our kids, they find increasing FA across the brain with slightly smaller increases in areas of the corpus callosum and the uncinate, for example, compared to the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus, which has some of the bigger changes. But then they also extended this to look at fixel-based metrics, and specifically they looked at fiber density and fiber cross-section and looked at how these changed within these girls to again provide some more specificity to the, the processes that are going on during this time. So what they saw when they looked at fiber density, that's over here on the left, and fiber cross-section over here on the right, is that both were increasing in most tracts, but the increases were more prominent in fiber coherence. Uh, sorry, fiber cross-section, not coherence, um, rather than the fiber density. So 
suggesting actually something very similar to what we're seeing that it's axon packing perhaps that's really dominating the processes in childhood here the maturation processes now one thing i want to point out and this actually ties very nicely to the question earlier about that other data plot is that there's a huge amount of scatter across the individuals and the variation across individuals is almost as much as the development that we see across our age range. But when you look at individuals, although there is variation and some might be going down, there tends to be less variation than there is across the whole data set. And the advantage of this data set is that we have lots of scans on some individuals. And so I'm just highlighting a few here. And you can see there's variation scan to scan. But overall, this person that starts above the curve tends to stay above the curve. And this person that starts below the curve tends to stay below the curve. And I think this first really highlights the importance of the longitudinal data and suggests that it may be looking at trajectories where we get more sensitive. So these are all typically developing kids, right? And they're all, or for the most part, they're following the general curve of the whole group. But it may be that we need to get concerned when they start dropping off the curve rather than if they're below and tracking below. So a little bit of um, connection here to a cognitive skill, and I'm going to focus on reading and pre-reading. And reading, of course, is a, a really critical skill for success in life. It's associated with academic performance, mental health, and career prospects. And early reading skills really emerge in early childhood. And they're, they're being refined, of course, throughout childhood. But some of these precursors to reading really come out in these young kids. And in particular, phonological processing and speeded naming are very strongly predictive of later reading abilities in kids. So most of the kids in our group, of course, are too young to be reading. And when they were all recruited, they were, um, it was prior to formal reading instruction. But we are able to measure phonological processing and speed and naming and look at how those relate to brain structure. Now, a wealth of data from older children and adolescents shows us that the reading network is left lateralized and it primarily involves left inferior frontal, left temporal parietal, and left temporal occipital areas of the brain. And um, pretty consistently, better reading is associated with stronger structural connectivity in the brain. And in particular, an area in the left temporal parietal region is associated with reading abilities. And FA there, higher FA there is associated with better reading abilities. You'll notice that this is um, contained within a part of the arcuate fasciculus, and the arcuate fasciculus is a very important tract for language and reading. So it's a frontal temporal connection <clears throat> supporting language and reading. And it tends to be leftward symmetric in most individuals. So about 90% of children, adolescents, and adults have leftward asymmetry in the arcuate. It also shows functional asymmetry within the brain and or not the arcuate, but the, the regions it connects. So this functional asymmetry is present even in infancy. And then studies have shown that that functional asymmetry increases between late childhood and early adulthood. So we wanted to look really at how this asymmetry might be emerging in our young kids and then how it was related to their emerging reading and pre-reading skills. So we looked at our data, we calculated an asymmetry index and this is left minus right divided by left plus right. So anything above zero indicates leftward asymmetry and anything below zero indicates rightward asymmetry. And here I'm showing the asymmetry index for the number of streamlines. So this is really a measure of sort of macro structural asymmetry. And what you can see is that we've got <clears throat> this leftward asymmetry in most of the individuals and that it's present even as young as two. So we actually see no significant changes across the age range. I just see a question popped up. Are there Sorry, any relations? Yeah. Unmute you. You're going to ask your question. Um, Bruce, you want to make your question? <clears throat> 
Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought I just typed it in. I didn't know I was supposed to talk. Um, I was just curious if you um, have noticed any kind of uh, parallel structural changes with regards to math and spatial reasoning ability uh, as with language and um, reading and whether or not those actually go par in parallel or, or sort of maybe inverse correlations between those. Yeah, it's a good question. We haven't looked at that in this data. Um, it's a little well, I, I'm not a, a math or spatial reasoning expert, but um, we have limited time and we focused to, to do assessments in the kids, I mean, and we focused for now on the pre-reading language measures. In older kids, there are certainly overlaps in some of the areas involved. Um, so there's some overlap and some specificity to regions, but um, that's a little bit beyond my expertise off the top of my head right now. We hope to look at that in our older kids where we do have much better measures of math and reading. And actually I have a student who's working on the math right now. So I might be able to give you a better answer in our data in, uh, in a year or so. So in terms of asymmetry, we see this leftward asymmetry even in our very young kids and we see that it doesn't change across the age range so it's largely established even by age two and then pretty stable across the age range then we looked at microstructural asymmetry and again we see predominantly leftward asymmetry of fa so most of the kids are leftwardly asymmetric, some of them are right, um, and again, no significant changes across this age range. When we looked at MD, we do see changes of asymmetry across the age range. So now MD goes down with age, so this line you're seeing actually um, where it's decreasing AI, but this indicates more leftward asymmetry across the age range. So we're seeing this macrostructural asymmetry established as young as two, but this increasing microstructural asymmetry across early childhood. We also looked at functional asymmetry, and here we looked at functional connectivity from the inferior frontal gyrus, and we see <clears throat> increasing leftward functional asymmetry, sorry, increasingly leftward asymmetric functional connectivity, both for intra and interhemispheric. So this asymmetry is increasing across our age range, becoming more leftwardly asymmetric, particularly when we look at the inferior frontal area. So we have this established macrostructural asymmetry, and then we have increasing microstructural and functional asymmetry across our age range. So to us, the next really logical question here was how is this functional and structural asymmetry associated with the emerging language and reading measures across this age range? So we looked at our phonological processing and our speeded naming measures, and we see really clearly that left arcuate FA is associated, yep, yeah, sorry, that our left arcuate FA is associated with phonological processing, so higher FA is associated with better phonological processing skills. This is very similar to studies in older children, but also shows that this relationship is present early, even before these kids are beginning to read. But then when we looked at relationships between our pre-reading language measures and our measures of asymmetry, we didn't see any significant relationships. So not with the macrostructure or the microstructure or the functional asymmetry. None of them were related to our pre-reading language measures. So what this is suggesting to us is not that there's no relationship, because we clearly see a brain language relationship, but perhaps because this asymmetry is emerging over early childhood, we're also not yet seeing the relationship between the asymmetry and the language measure. So it may be that it's still supporting emerging cognitive skills, just that that relationship hasn't quite been established yet. And so now um, with the last few minutes, I want to connect these this brain maturation in early childhood again to kids with prenatal alcohol exposure. So I mentioned earlier that we see these widespread reductions of brain volume in children with prenatal alcohol exposure, um, total brain volume and regional brain volumes as well as cortical thickness. <clears throat> 
we also see changes in brain development in these kids. So um, here we had looked at prenatal alcohol exposure versus unexposed kids, changes in cortical volume over a couple of years. And in blue, these are the kids with prenatal alcohol exposure. You see pretty consistent decreases across the age range. But in black, these are the unexposed kids and you see much more non-linear trajectories where we have sort of increases of cortical volume followed by decreases, really suggesting that the kids with PAE have kind of less plasticity in their brain perhaps than these unexposed controls. So we see widespread white matter differences in PAE. I'd mentioned this before. And really universally what studies have shown is that there's lower FA in older children, adolescents, and adults with prenatal alcohol exposure, widespread across the brain and lower FA. But nobody's really looked at younger kids, and this is a really important age range because it's when the behavioral and cognitive problems associated with PAE typically become apparent. So we wanted to look at this in these young kids. And uh, if you think scanning a typical two and three year old is challenging, um, you can come see us try with kids with behavioral issues. My PhD student Preeti Carr here has been very creative and patient and persistent in her methods to help encourage these kids to go in the scanner. So we've been able to study 49 kids with prenatal alcohol exposure between two and seven years. And we compared these to a typically developing group, the kids that I have shown before just matched for age and sex. And what we saw was um, actually kind of surprising to us. We saw not lower, but we saw higher FA in our young kids with prenatal alcohol exposure compared to controls. So we saw this in the whole brain when we looked at all of the white matter um, averaged together. We see this in a couple of corpus callosum regions. We saw it in the pyramidal tracts. And then we see it in a number of other areas where the changes were just not significant. In fact, the only area where we saw significantly lower FA in the children with prenatal alcohol exposure was the fornix. So to help us try to understand this, we went to our longitudinal data, and we have a lot of longitudinal data in the typical kids. We're starting to get some longitudinal data in the kids with prenatal alcohol exposure. And we see different development trajectories. So in blue are the kids with PAE, and in black are the unexposed controls. And what you can see is that these controls follow this nice increasing FA pattern across the age range, whereas the kids with PAE still have increases, but much um, less increase overall than the kids with no prenatal alcohol exposure. So you can see that if you look at the younger age range, you can, you'll have higher FA in the kids with PAE compared to controls. But if we look in older kids, if you kind of imagine extending this out, and all of the previous studies have been age five and up, you would see lower FA in the kids with alcohol exposure. So we think this is perhaps suggesting premature brain development in these kids with PAE that then leads to an earlier plateau in development. So depending on where you look, you might find different things. This also agrees nicely with the volume data that I showed you earlier in that overall these kids with prenatal alcohol exposure seem to be having less brain change, less plasticity and, and less sort of um, development happening in these age ranges compared to controls who have more plasticity as they age. <clears throat> So there are a number of studies um, suggesting that premature brain development is associated with exposure to early adversity. So for example, studies have shown accelerated DNA methylation and advanced puberty. So here is the number of threat exposures that a child had early in their life versus puberty and the more threat exposures are associated with um, a more advanced stage of puberty. And then it's also associated with fat, faster brain maturation. So this study actually um, computed a metric that was representing the proportion of the brain that was adult-like. So in adolescents with more threat exposures, they had more, a higher proportion of their brain was adult-like. And 
it may be that prenatal exposure to alcohol is sort of a, a form of early adversity. It's different than these postnatal threat experiences, but it may still be an adversity that's pushing the brain to develop too early. And in fact, the difference between kids with exposure or not may be even more prominent at younger age ranges, which are closer to that sort of adversity exposure itself. So to summarize this this section, we know that early childhood is a critical time of rapid brain development. And we've shown some regional variation in that development as well as emerging asymmetry of the arcuate. And then we've also shown data that suggests that there's premature brain development in children with prenatal alcohol exposure. So to wrap all of this up, I just have sort of a few concluding points I want to make. And the first is that high quality MRI is possible even in young kids. And we've had a lot of fun with it and so have the kids. Um, and it's, it's possible and it's important to really understand what's happening in this early childhood age range. And longitudinal data especially is important for understanding trajectories, not just in kids, but across the lifespan. So to understand where kids fall relative to a curve and how, how they stay there. And this came up, like I said, in that question earlier, that we don't know why some of these kids um, maybe aren't experiencing the same type of trajectory of development, but I think it's important for us to keep trying to figure out why. We see extensive development in early childhood with a number of different metrics of white matter showing changes. And then we see ongoing changes in adolescence that really appear to be dominated primarily by axon packing. And then in individuals with prenatal alcohol exposure, we see widespread changes to the white matter and changes to structural connectivity, as well as altered development trajectories in the young kids. And so just to finish off, I want to thank my lab, and this is how our lab meetings look these days, as I'm sure they do for many of you. Um, I haven't listed everyone here, but I do want to thank in particular the people that did most of the work I presented. I want to thank my collaborators. This is our lab in, in pre-pandemic times. We have a lot of fun. We're close to the mountains. We can go have fun lab events and retreats there. And I want to put in a little plug. I am recruiting postdocs, so if you're interested, please get in touch. And then, so finally, I want to thank um, my funding sources and, of course, thank you for your attention today.